uh, singing of the goodness of God. So uh, this past week, the madness has uh, begun. I always look forward uh, to March uh, madness. Uh, my parents growing up, I got to be careful what I say this morning because my parents are sitting uh, right over there. Uh, but growing up, uh, my parents uh, were pretty strict about our attendance at school. Uh, we took a trip to uh, Disney World when I was in first grade, and uh, we took a trip to uh, visit my sister while she was studying abroad over in Costa Rica uh, my senior year of high school. So we took two trips uh, during school. But outside of that, uh, we were pretty much expected to be in school, and they were pretty pretty strict about that. The only other times where we wouldn't uh, have to go to school is if we were pretty sick or if we uh, had mom thinking uh, we were uh, pretty sick. And yes, I was pretty sick every time, mom. Uh, Don't worry about that. Uh, But growing up, I was a big uh, college basketball uh, fan. So naturally, I really enjoyed watching uh, March Madness, the big tournament uh, for college uh, basketball. And the issue is a lot of the games took place uh, during while I was in school. They they were during the afternoon. So shamefully, uh, my freshman and sophomore year of high school, I got pretty good at watching the games on our laptops that they gave to us in the middle of class and uh, swiping the screen before teachers would realize uh, what was taking place. I got better at that than I probably should have. Then I should have, absolutely. Uh, but to my uh, great delight and surprise, my dad took me out of school for two days in my junior and senior year of high school uh, to watch March Madness with them. And ever since then, it's been a tradition uh, that we watched the first week of March Madness together. And this year, they had to travel here as it was too close uh, to Jamie's uh, due date. Um, and I would have been in the doghouse if I was in Michigan watching basketball with my dad while Jamie uh, went into labor. So here we are, here they are. Uh, But the tournament is called uh, March Madness because there is a lot of madness that is associated with this tournament. There is game after game after game after game, and there are loads of upsets. And with all these upsets, it leads people to be mad, to be angry. My dad, Brian, and I are in a bracket, and I think between the three of us, there's definitely been some madness between us these past couple of days because of all these different chaotic scenarios uh, in the uh, tournament. Um, and on a, a, on a similar but completely different uh, level, talk about this madness, this mayhem of uh, March madness. Uh, none of us are caught by surprise that the front lines of war are filled with mayhem and they are filled with Madness, And that's what we get to talk uh, about today as we continue our series on marching for missions. As we, the church, we are in the midst of a war, a war between light and darkness and a war between God and Christ and his followers and the followers of the devil, the followers of the world outside influence. And the good, for, good news for us is that we already know the outcome of the war. Those who align themselves with God and his son, Jesus Christ, they will come out victorious. There are zero upsets in this war. We already know without a doubt that God and his followers are going to come out victorious. And so in this spiritual war that we, along with everybody else, is fighting, our objective as a church is to grow closer to God and expand his kingdom. In this war that we're fighting, growing closer to God, that is our defense. That's our shield. That's our breastplate of righteousness. That we not be swayed by the influences of the devil and of the world and of those who are not aligned with God and his son, Jesus Christ. And on the other hand, expanding God's kingdom, that is our offensive, that is our attack in this war. And as we fight this war between light and darkness, we've been talking about how this war is fought on on many different locations. Thus far throughout this series, we've talked about how this war is fought in the training grounds. The training grounds is is where we are right now, that the safety of these four walls, the church building. We've talked about how this war is fought at our military bases, our home bases. That's where we reside, our homes. And today we talk about this war being fought on the front lines. And again, the front lines of any war is absolutely mayhem. 
I've been keeping tabs, as I'm guessing a lot of you guys have as well. I've been keeping tabs on the Russia-Ukraine war uh, practically uh, daily. Uh, and it's terrible seeing what is taking place on the front lines. Not even mentioning the, the many deaths of soldiers fighting other soldiers. But we, we, we hear about and we see stories of thousands upon thousands of Ukrainian civilians being stranded and trapped in different cities with little to no resources. And it's absolute mayhem. It's absolutely madness. In this war, both the, the war in Russia and Ukraine, the war, World War II, World War I, all these different wars and the war that we are fighting, the spiritual war, the war is won or lost essentially on the front lines. And so the front lines is such a crucial location of war. And in the spiritual war that we are fighting, the front lines are very important as well. And the front, and, 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 and our analogy of this war, our spiritual war, the front lines represents our relationships with those outside of our family. So that means our relationships with our friends, our relationships with our coworkers, employees, employers, friends at school, anybody that you have a relationship with outside of your family. That is the front lines in this analogy. That is what we will be talking about today and winning the war on the front lines. And so we've talked about in this war, we have many different battles going on in the training grounds that are military bases and then on the front bases. And we have different objectives. We have different strategies in each of these different locations. And in the front lines, our main objective, our main strategy is expanding God's kingdom to our circle of influence. As ultimately our goal when we are expanding God's kingdom to our circle of influence is that we want to create another person who can then expand God's kingdom themselves. So we are creating another evangelizer and we are creating another disciple maker. When this is successfully done, the growth of the church is exponential. Absolutely exponential. We're not talking about addition, but it will grow exponentially if we are creating other disciple makers who then create other disciple makers who then create other disciple makers. That's exactly what we see in the early church in the church of Acts. We see this message of Jesus being the Messiah. We saw that message spread like wildfire. Because we have people like Peter and Paul who are disciples of Christ, followers of Christ. They then themselves made more followers of Christ. And these different followers of Christ made more followers of Christ. And it spread like wildfire. They were expanding God's kingdom at an exponential rate because they were creating more and more disciple makers. As that's the ultimate goal. That's, that's the end goal when we are expanding God's kingdom. Now, when we take a, a look at the life of Jesus, we, 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 when we're faced with a question, we should often ask, how would Jesus handle this situation? And when, we're at, when we ask the question, how are we to expand God's kingdom on the front lines? We should ask, well, how did Jesus expand the kingdom in the front lines? And we can see how Jesus expanded the kingdom of his father in the book of Matthew. If you, if you have your Bible, you can open up to the book of Matthew, and we'll be reading from Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, we'll be reading just verses 10 through 13. And we can see how Jesus himself expanded God's kingdom here on earth. And so in Matthew chapter uh, 9, verse 10 reads, And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. So what we see here, a little, a little context of what's taking place here. Jesus, he has just called Matthew, who was a tax collector, to follow him. And then all of a sudden we're transported in, in, verse, in verse 10, and we see Jesus is reclining at the table of Matthew with the tax collectors and sinners. And in verse 11, and when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he, being Jesus, said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. 
Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so here in this historical context uh, of this Jewish background between Jesus and these Pharisees, the Jews, they did not really associate with the tax collectors, and they wanted to separate themselves from the sinners of the world, as how could holy followers of God associate and hang out with the sinners of the world? And so all of a sudden, this Jesus, this radical Messiah, he kind of changes the perspective. And now Jesus, this Messiah, the Christ, he is spending time with these tax collectors and with these sinners of the world. And the Pharisees, the Pharisees ask Jesus, why in the world are you doing such a thing? But Jesus says, I did not come to call the righteous, but instead I came to call the sinners. And so Jesus, as his objective was to expand God's kingdom, his offensive in the spiritual war that we are fighting, he developed a relationship with the people who needed to hear about God and his Christ and the coming kingdom. He took that time. If, apparently, if you read through uh, the book of Luke, I didn't count this uh, myself, but, but I read this this past week, you'll see Jesus enter the house of 11 different people uh, in the gospel of Luke. And so Jesus, he took this idea of developing a relationship with those outside of the church very, very seriously. That was one of the key ways in which he expanded God's kingdom. And once he developed that relationship with them, once he developed a relationship with Matthew, the tax collector, it was then that Jesus was able to present the gospel message, the good news of the kingdom of God. We see in Luke chapter 10, we won't go there. You just have to trust my word or you, or you can look at it afterwards. But in Luke chapter 10, when Jesus sends out his 72 followers, the 72 disciples to spread the message of the kingdom, he instructs his disciples to go and enter the house of the people. Jesus wanted his followers to go and develop a relationship with people who did not already have a living and active faith in God and his son, Jesus Christ. As Jesus saw the value that the relationships had when a believer was a friend with a non-believer, he understood that, he knew that. And today, studies show, that the, uh, we, this is a study that, that we reference quite a bit here, studies show that the single most effective mode of evangelism, of expanding God's kingdom is relational evangelism. The idea that you develop a relationship with someone, you gain their trust, you befriend them, and then you use that opportunity, you use that trust, you use that influence that you have gained with them, and then you use that to expand God's kingdom by sharing the gospel message, sharing the good news that Jesus Christ died for them. And so when we talk about fighting this war on the front lines, the people outside of our family, I encourage you guys to purposefully develop relationships with the sinners of the world. And when you do, you will find opportunities to share the gospel message with them. If we are effectively growing closer to God at our home base, uh, last week we talked about our home base, and one of the key objectives of our home base is growing closer to God. And if you have successfully, effectively grown closer to God at your home base, then you will have a defense against the influences of the outside world. You have a defense against the devil and the followers of the world. And so we don't need to necessarily worry about uh, that too much if we are growing closer to God at home. This only works if you are growing closer to God at your home, spending time in prayer and reading your word. And we've talked about the extreme importance at the home bases uh, last week. So we have to remember that, that this war is being fought on all sides. But we need to be developing these relationships with people outside of the church. And when we develop a relationship with someone who does not have an active and living faith in God, we have to understand that that is only half of the battle. 
And the truth of the matter is that is the easy half of the battle, developing these relationships with these different people. Once we develop a relationship with people who have a living faith, then we actually need to verbally share the gospel message with them. If we don't take that opportunity, then that relationship is all for naught. In the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10, Paul tells us the importance of verbally sharing the gospel message with others. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, Paul writes, For everyone, not just some, not just most, but for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Paul says, if someone calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. So Paul continues in verse 14 then, and he writes, how then? Will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then Paul asks the question, how in the world Are they supposed to call on the name of the Lord if they don't even believe in the Lord? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is, it's impossible. You cannot, with the right intentions, with with, with the, the, the purposes of your heart, call on the name of the Lord if you don't believe in the Lord in the first place. It's impossible. And then Paul continues, the next question we have to consider is how are they supposed to believe in God and his son Jesus if they have never even heard of them and their goodness? How? How are they supposed to believe in someone that they have never even heard of? And then Paul asks, how are they to hear without someone preaching? That's the key. That's the key. Someone's got to hear this message of the kingdom by someone. Paul here, he he uses the word preaching. uh, And and oftentimes in our current context, we think of preaching in a similar setting like this where I am preaching to you guys. But I think more effectively talking about just sharing and talking and have a conversation about God and his son Jesus in the coming kingdom. And so I know preaching can kind of have a negative uh, connotation in our, in our society. Oh, you're getting preachy, you're preaching uh, to these people, yada, yada, yada. But have a conversation with these people. Let them verbally hear, audibly hear about God and his son and their love that they have for them. Without this, without you sharing verbally the message of the gospel, they cannot put their faith, they cannot put their belief in God and his son, Jesus Christ. Because how are they supposed to call on the name in whom they don't even believe? And how are they supposed to believe in someone that they have not even heard of? And so you play such an important role in this process. As you uh, have been called, you have a responsibility to go and be that person who verbally shares the message of the kingdom. For you all are sitting here today because someone took the courage, someone took the boldness, someone took the initiative to talk to you, to tell you, that there is a God who is alive and well. And that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. We can all trace it back. Sometimes people trace it back to uh, technology and and seeing uh, an an audio uh, recording of uh, people sharing of this good news. We're getting fancy in, in the 21st century. But one way or another, whether it was on recording or not, I'm guessing it was in person with all of us in here. One way or another, someone shared the word of God with you, and that is why. That's what started you being right here today. 
For many of us, that might be our parents, but for some of us, it might be a friend at work, a friend at school, a coworker, employee, employer, whomever it may be. And so you've been blessed by someone sharing that message with you, and now you have that responsibility to be a blessing to someone else. As from what I see in the Church of America, we do a pretty decent job of developing relationships with people outside of the church. The first couple centuries after Jesus, we see uh, like the monastic movement and these monks separate, completely separating themselves from society. We don't see that a ton in the church in America today. We're, we're pretty good at developing relationships with people outside of the church. But from my experience with the Church of America struggles is that we don't use these relationships, we don't use the trust that we have built to use that as an opportunity to expand God's coming kingdom by sharing the gospel message with others. And in my eyes, in, in, in this relational evangelism formula, the hardest part about expanding God's kingdom is starting the conversation in the first place. It is so uncomfortable at times. It can be extremely awkward to talk about God as God and religion is seen as a taboo in our society. We don't talk about God outside of the church setting. And so all of these outside influences make it really difficult, really awkward, and extremely uncomfortable to talk about God, to start that conversation in the first place but I am urging you guys, I'm asking you guys to step outside of your comfort zone. I ask you guys to consider, was it within David's comfort zone to battle Goliath? Do you think it was within Paul's comfort zone to travel the world, to spread the message of the kingdom, the Christian message, the same Christian message that he sought to, uh, to suppress? Do you think it was within Daniel's comfort zone to be cast into the den of lions? Do you think it was within Abraham's comfort zone to leave his home and everything that he knew and his family all in Ur? Do you think it was within Christ's comfort zone to die on the cross for your sins? I say the answer is a big resounding no. It was not within their comfort zone. Hardly anything great for God happens within our comfort zone. It's when we step out in faith that God works wonders in our lives, that God has worked wonders in the lives of the heroes of our faith that we can read about in the scriptures. But had these people not stepped outside of their comfort zone, had they not stepped out in faith, they would have been completely lost in the books of history, and we would not know a single one of them. But because they did, we talk about them thousands of years later because of the great work that God did through them. And so when we step outside of our comfort zone to start that conversation about the gospel message with our circle of influence, it's then that God can do great and mighty works through us. He can do mighty works through you if you step out of your comfort zone and starting that conversation about God and Jesus in the coming kingdom. And so since in my eyes, that's the hardest part in this formula of relational evangelism, expanding God's kingdom to our circle of influence, I want to end with providing you all a couple of tips of how to start that conversation with your friends, with your coworkers, with people at school and neighbors and whomever else. As we want to make this as easy as possible for you, it's still not going to be easy. It's still going to be uncomfortable, but hopefully you'll have a better understanding of how you can start that uh, conversation in the first place. And so the first tip that I would give to you guys is that questions are your best friend. Ask questions and let spiritual conversations flow from there. Oftentimes uh, when you ask a question to a friend of yours, you are then provided an opportunity to answer that same question. 
And when you are given that opportunity to answer a question, I'd encourage you guys to incorporate God somehow. As every question that we are asked, that is an opportunity to seize. We are asked ordinary questions tens or hundreds of times throughout a day. And I'd encourage you guys to take those opportunities, take those ordinary questions that you are asked and answer them in an unordinary fashion. If someone asks, hey, how are you doing? Say, well, thanks to God and his love for me, I'm doing pretty good. So questions are your best friend. Another tip to start the conversation is to casually drop hints about Christian activities that you are involved in. When you, when you let your friends know about the community that you are part of here at North Hills, or if you're involved with, with other uh, faith communities, like maybe Young Life or uh, all these different other uh, Christian ministries, if you let them know that you're involved with them, you drop hints about that, they may inquire more. And if someone asks you what you are doing this weekend, then let them know, hey, I have plans and going to church. And share with them, hey, what are you talking about in church right now? Well, we're talking about marching for missions. We're talking about expanding God's kingdom here on earth. And so draw pens about the, the, the different Christian communities that you are a part of. And then maybe if they inquire more about it, invite them. Invite them to be a part of that Christian community, that family of God, that body of Christ. And you can also use uh, different current events uh, to help you out. You can ask others, hey, have you heard about Russia declaring war on Ukraine? Why would God allow such a thing? That's, uh, that's another question, question being your best friend, that can lead to spiritual conversations. And so this morning, I just want to provide a list of different examples that you could use to try and start a conversation about the gospel message. So yeah, there we go. So th these are the examples uh, of the different ways that we can start a conversation about God and the gospel message. First one, you can ask, uh, what do you think would be the best or worst way to die? This, that's not a question that has any uh, religion implication, but what do you just think would be the best or worst way to die? That's like the icebreaker question that you talk with your friends. Everybody has their answer. And then when you ask that, you may ask then after, well, what do you think happens after death? And that's when we, we start to get into spiritual conversations where we say, well, we, we believe that we rest in the grave until Christ comes back to earth to establish his kingdom. So something silly like asking, what do you think would be the best or worst way to die can lead to a spiritual conversation because questions are our best friends. Example number two, I'm learning how to become a better listener. Can I ask you a few questions about life and spirituality? Some of you guys uh, may find that question uh, cheesy, but it gets the job done. Can I ask you a few questions about life and spirituality? Or we talked about this a bit earlier. What are your plans for the weekend? When they respond with their plans for the weekend, oftentimes they'll respond by asking, well, what are your plans for the weekend? And that's when you incorporate your, your plans revolving around church. Next question, have you ever had anyone approach you and try to talk to you about God? They may answer no, yes, and that, that can lead to further discussion. Or if you could ask God any question, what would it be? Be, you know, kind of a, a broad question that can lead to, to other discussion as well. Or did you hear about dot, dot, dot? Did you hear about Russia declaring war on Ukraine? Uh, why would God allow such a thing? You can ask someone, is there anything that I can pray for? Can I pray for you? And, and whatever you are going through. Or you can also use a sometime question. Simply ask, I would love to hear more about what you believe about God. Could we get together sometime and talk about what you believe? And so putting off a bit, but actually scheduling a time. I am, I'm a person who is uh, so forgetful and I'd be completely lost without my calendar on my phone. Maybe what's needed is you and your friend need to schedule a time to go grab a drink of coffee, whatever, go out to eat, and then maybe you could talk about a more meaty discussion uh, like what do you believe about God. And so these are just a couple of different examples of how you can start that conversation. Because I don't know about you guys, but for me, that's the hardest part in this equation. Is that, is that the case with any of you guys? Raise your hand if starting that conversation is the hardest part for you. 
I see a lot of head nodding and more hands raising. That seems to be the hardest part about expanding God's kingdom in the front lines. And we all know the adage that practice makes perfect. You're only going to get better at starting that conversation the more you try. I'm going to tell you, it's going to be extremely uncomfortable, extremely awkward, but we've got to step outside of our comfort zone because of all the implications of this war that we are fighting in. And so to end uh, today, we're going to do a little exercise that probably about 99% of you guys are going to hate. Uh, but... <laughs> We are going to do it not because uh, we, we want what you guys want, but ultimately we are trying to do what God wants, and God wants us to expand his coming kingdom. And so we've got to get practice and learning how to start these conversations about spreading this gospel message to others. And so we're going to do a little role play uh, this morning. That's becoming a popular trend uh, nowadays. So we're going to do a little role play ourselves. You're going to pair up with someone, and one of you is going to try to start a conversation about the gospel message. And the other person, you're going to pretend to be a friend who doesn't have a living and active faith. And so you're going to pair up with someone. My one request is that you pair up with someone not sitting in your own row. I don't want you talking with your spouses or your children, but talk with someone who's not sitting in your own row. And we'll say this right now. This is going to make all of you guys, I'm, going to, I'm just going to go out and say, all of you guys are going to be uncomfortable with this exercise. But again, nothing great Hardly anything great happens within our comfort zone, and we need to practice. Practice makes perfect. We need to practice stepping outside of our comfort zone, because when we do that, God can and he will do mighty, mighty works in and through you. So I'm going to give you guys a minute and a half for each side, a minute and a half for you to talk to uh, your new friend. You're, you're just meeting each other. You're, you're going out to, to take an out or taking a bite to eat or whatever. I'm struggling with talking here. You're going to talk for one and a half minutes. You're just meeting, and you're going to try to start a conversation about the gospel. You're going to try and make a smooth transition as possible, and yeah, we'll see how it goes. And I know you don't like it, but I would love for all of you guys to participate participate in this as practice makes perfect. So I'll start my timer. Everybody go ahead and pair up with someone not sitting in your own row. All right, good work, everybody. Go ahead and head back to your seats. Yeah, I'll wrap up in like one minute. <laughs> uh, uh, All right, go ahead and find the seat. So again, relational evangelism. Studies, to, studies today show that relational evangelism is the single most effective mode of expanding God's kingdom today in our society. When we study the life and ministry of Jesus, we see that that was the most effective way that he spread this message of the kingdom as well. And so I encourage you guys to develop those relationships Develop those relationships with people outside of the church. And probably many of you guys, you guys probably already have those relationships. If you're someone who doesn't have a relationship with someone outside the church, then I encourage you to be purposeful about it. Try and find that relationship with someone outside of the church. But that's only half the battle. That's the easy half of the battle. Once we have that relationship, once we have that trust and that influence, we then need to take the opportunity to share the gospel message because their eternal life is at stake. It's your responsibility to plant that seed and to water that seed. And when you do, God will provide the growth. Let's pray. 
Father, we love you. We thank you. Father, I just pray that each and every one of us here uh, this morning, that we take that duty, that responsibility of sharing this gospel message with those around us. I pray that we take it with of the utmost importance. And Father, I just pray that as we plant these seeds, as we water these seeds of this gospel message, Father, I pray that you provide miraculous growth in the lives of our friends. As Father, you are a miracle worker, a miracle maker. And Father, we pray that you show the world who you are, that you show the world of the promise of your kingdom and that they can be a part of it too one day. So we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.